Hi, so welcome to Journey Into Parenting. Um, so I'm here to make a space for you to help you prepare for having your first child because it is one of the most enormous life transitions that you'll ever go through. Um, and I think it's really important to take time to nurture yourself and prepare um, on a practical level, but also on an emotional and spiritual level for the transition. Because then, you know, my best hope for you is that um, that can help you to have a really beautiful life um, along with your baby and your child as they grow. Um, I've got Sheena here today and Sheena does lots of um, seasonal yoga and holistic therapies. Um, and she also does something really interesting, which is um, ceremonies for women after they've had a baby. Um, and so, yeah, so I just wanted to have a conversation um, about that and that the importance of kind of, again, like honoring this really special time and, and the kind of the hugeness of the transition that women go through. Um, yeah, so I wonder if you could just tell us a bit more, Sheena, about that. About the closing the bones in particular. Yeah. Mm. So the way that I have been taught it and that I practice it um, comes from a South American tradition and it's practiced in quite a lot of South American countries. Um, and it is the process, um, so it kind of takes two parts or, or works on, on two different levels of using um, a special cloth called a rebozo. So I have one here. Um, and a rebozo is a cotton cloth that's made in a particular kind of weave. Um, so it's it's very strong, um, but it's got a little a little bit of give in it as well. Um, and a rebozo, a woman would have a rebozo um, in pregnancy, um, which she would use um, to kind of to bind her hips in pregnancy or to use in rocking and kind of massage to ease the pelvis. Um, and also during labour and birth, it would often be used um, kind of around the pelvis as a kind of hammock, again, for a midwife or a birth partner to help the labouring woman and the birthing woman. And then once a woman has given birth, it can be used to carry the baby as a kind of sling. Yeah, I was reading about that, actually. That's that's really amazing that it kind of it goes the whole way through. Yeah, it's so beautiful mm -hmm. that the, the cloth kind of transitions with the mother as the mother is born, kind of along with the baby. The cloth yeah. takes all these different forms. Um, mm -hmm. and, and one of the forms is to wrap the hips and wrap the pelvis um, mm -hmm. to help to actually physically close the bones because the process of giving birth requires a huge opening of the pelvic mm -hmm. bones in order for the baby to move down and through mm -hmm. in order to be born. Um, and bringing the bones of the pelvis back together um, is a big part of postnatal recovery and helping us to kind of regain the structure of our pelvis, which is a hugely supportive structure within the body and the seat of a lot of our health. But also on an emotional and a spiritual level, it's about gathering yourself back in. Um, and so we don't just open physically when we birth a baby, we open emotionally, you know, there's a huge surrendering and letting go that happens in order to allow yourself to go through this process of bringing a baby into the world. And yeah, as you birth a baby, you, you birth a mother within yourself as well. Mm. So the closing the bone ceremony is really about that woman being witnessed for the transition that she's been through, for the journey that she's taken being held and supported both physically with the cloth around her pelvis, but also emotionally by her community, by the women around her. And yeah, on a spiritual level to help kind of draw your energies back in as well, to center you and give you that kind of fortitude that you need going forward for the job of, of uh, caring for a baby and raising a child. Mm, it's amazing. And it's, um, I feel like, you know, the work of mothering, which I think can also be done by men, but that work of nurturing a child is actually, it's the very foundations of the society that we live in. Like the way that we care for our children literally shapes their brains, you know, whether they feel cared for and loved, um, you know, determines how calm um, they're going to feel later on in their lives. And actually um, how, you know how often that isn't honoured or acknowledged in the way that it should be and so it made me feel quite emotional hearing you describe 
that process to, to actually you know um acknowledge the enormity of you know not only the experience of birth but actually you know transitioning to being in this role which is it's quite profoundly a role of service actually you know that somehow you know something happens to us where we're just we're willing to get up in the middle of the night um you know and and care for another human being um more than we care for ourselves and yeah it's really huge yeah giving yourself over so completely like that it's a really big ask of us yeah. and if you're not nurtured and nourished yourself if you're not strong within yourself how mm. can you give of yourself so completely to another being mm -hmm. it, and it does it makes a huge difference I've had three children and I've learned more about these different practices and processes mm. as I've gone through it's been very much a part of my journey into motherhood mm. of learning learning about these practices and when I had my third baby, there was quite a big gap in between my, my second and my third baby. I can remember after my second baby was born, getting out of bed um, when, when he was maybe just three years old to go for three days old, sorry, to go for a walk and literally feeling like the insides of my body were going to fall out through my pelvic floor, feeling so unsupported. Okay. And the difference after I had my third baby and I knew about this practice of wrapping the pelvis and closing the bones. Mm -hmm. um, and so even before I'd formally had that ceremony, because that ceremony is often held when the baby is nine months old, because that's a, a kind of specific, a relevant point within mm -hmm. the journey. Um, but even before I was wrapping my pelvis myself, just to give myself support, and the difference that I felt in terms of my kind of inner strength and my inner energy was just incredible. Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I like the fact that it has a, a kind of symbolic function and a practical one mm. together. Um, I was listening the other day to, um, there's a feminist sociologist called Anne Oakley um, and, and her work's really interesting. So in the 80s, she interviewed um, over 50 women kind of um, in the months before they had their baby and then um, kind of up to six months afterwards. And um, what she found in the interviews was that a lot of the time when people are diagnosed with postnatal depression, um, it, it isn't actually depression, it's just that they're exhausted um, and that you know they don't have the right support or the right skills. Um, and that if we if we just kind of you know were able to support new mothers more effectively than you know that that distress that a lot of women experience after birth um you know wouldn't be a thing mm. um, yeah i couldn't agree more with that mm. i think that um there's so much yeah so much asked of your system in so many ways to grow birth and and nurture a baby um, and if you're not properly prepared and properly nourished yourself you know what what do we expect really what other other than that can we expect so mm. i have this really lovely book that i was introduced to um in my oh, yeah. pregnancy. i have that book as well <laughs> the first 40 days and it it talks about it's written by a woman of uh, chinese american uh, mm. descent um and she talks about traditions from all over the world and kind of draws in practices from all, all around the world to do with nourishing the mother in the first 40 days after birth, which is also known as the fourth trimester. Um, and it again, this made an enormous difference to me to, mm -hmm. to have that knowledge about what specific nutrients do I need to be giving my body at this point? Mm -hmm. What specifically do I need? And the courage to ask the people around me to be there for me in a specific way because most often people are so delighted to ask to be a part of your inner circle when you're having a baby but they might not know themselves specifically what you need and mm -hmm. so to be able to give them some guidance about in these first few days i'd really appreciate being able to stay in bed and have this kind of food that i know will be really easy for me to digest really kind to my body really nourishing and most of the time you'll find that people will be really willing and and only too pleased to bring you some soup or yeah Whatever it is that you've asked for yeah it's something that i get um couples to do on my courses actually is to sort of to be very specific about what help they need and who they're going to ask 
for that help just to make it really practical because like you say I think most of the time you know especially when someone's had a baby we just we want to be there for them and, and help um, and for some reason often it can feel quite scary uh, to ask for that help but um, th there's evidence that um, it's a great way to build connections actually is to yeah to have that courage to to step up and ask. Um, I um, I ate the placenta and felt, you know, before I'd eaten it, I felt like I'd run a marathon and, you know, was totally kind of drained. And then I, yeah, cooked it up with some, you know, red wine sauce and mushrooms. <laughs> and, um, and then I felt amazing again, like it kind of really restored all the, all the nutrients back into my body. And um, again, like that, there's sort of growing evidence that, that you know, it, it really, it's not just psychosomatic it really does help in terms of restoring your body is that something you've read about as well yeah and again I didn't really know so much about that when I had my first baby I'd heard of it when I had my second but I was already in in um quite a state of low mood during my second pregnancy mm -hmm. and couldn't quite kind of reach out to to all of these things that I'd heard about and then when I had my third baby, I, I did actually arrange um, to have my placenta um, encapsulated. So I, I made a plan, actually, that um, my husband was going to, to prepare half of it for me to have in smoothies. Um, and, um, and then part of it would be in smoothies, part would be dried and encapsulated, mm -hmm. and part of it we would keep to bury. Um, and as it turned out, our birth third time round was very different to what we'd expected we'd had two home births with our first two children and then with our third baby when my waters broke there was a lot of meconium in my waters okay. so I was taken to hospital and and he was born in hospital and a friend who is a doula Torty Rye um, came and collected my placenta from the hospital and she prepared it for me she did two prints for me so I've got these beautiful placenta prints oh, cool. um, and but yeah, part of it, she cut it in, in half and half of it was kept to be buried and the other half was split. So again, half of that or quarter I had encapsulated and a quarter of it was prepared into smoothies that she brought back to me in the hospital. And I had the same experience that I was completely wiped out. I'd had a really challenging yeah. birth experience and the baby was... Um, was unwell he had an infection I had to stay in hospital while he had antibiotics um, it, in some ways it was there was kind of stress around that situation but she came like an angel with these smoothies to the hospital and I had the first one and I can remember getting about halfway through it and just feeling completely different yeah it completely turned everything around mm -hmm. it, yeah I find that amazing as well like I literally went from you know like my skin looked gray to suddenly after mm. having the placenta I kind of had color again and felt felt amazing mm. yeah um yeah it's a great thing I think another really nice piece of advice um that I had around the first six weeks is kind of um to just be realistic in what you're expecting of yourself you know in terms of like actually it's a lovely time to bond with your baby and just to kind of allow it to be the case that you're spending hours and hours feeding them often um but to try and do kind of one thing a day for yourself you know like even if it's just for 10 minutes to kind of do something that really nourishes you like read a book or go for a walk but yeah i think keeping that thread of self-care is really important mm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, I, that's another thing I love about that first 42 days book is that it's got some some lovely ideas in there for self-care things like mm -hmm. bath salts or, you know, something really simple that you can do, like putting a handful of salts in a, in a bowl and soaking your feet while you're feeding the baby. Or, yeah, uh, lovely. Yeah, really simple things, but things that can make quite a big difference. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, yeah, the other thing I wanted to talk about is that... Um, for me, um, giving birth itself felt like quite a profound rite of passage. Um, and I, I wondered whether that's something you'd experienced as well, or whether it kind of links in with the practices. Mm. Yeah, hugely. Mm. Um, I think that your body has never been through anything like that before when you give birth for the, for the first time. And each time, I've certainly found that each time I've given birth, it's been 
a different experience. Um, yeah, this, and quite often we, um, we prepare for um, birth in a way that we don't always prepare with the same amount of energy for the first six weeks or mm. going into motherhood. So yeah. there's quite a lot of attention and focus on this event of giving birth. Mm. Um, yeah, which can work in both ways, I suppose. It Hopefully it helps to really nourish you and give you the confidence that you need to step into this, this moment, this role of birthing your child, however it might turn out to be. Um, but it can also, I guess, build you, build up your hopes in a certain way. Um, and then if things don't go the way that you were hoping, it can leave you open to feeling disappointed in yourself or disappointed in the experience that you've had. And that's where the practices of yoga, I think, come in, um, come into their own. So mm. practicing yoga during pregnancy and having those tools to be able to focus on your breath very very simply to just be present in the moment and focus on your breath to feel what's going on in your body and to be able to adapt to the changes of circumstance and, and we practice that in pregnancy yoga by you know noticing our responses to different poses different postures how our response changes as we move throughout our pregnancy and learning that we might need to adapt things that we've done in a certain way for years but then be able to shift our expectations and, and change our approach um, and I think that that's a really valuable thing you know everything that we practice in in every realm of yoga is really about practicing something on the mat that we can then take off the mat and apply to our day-to-day -day lives um, and yeah um, yeah I, I really find that with meditation that it's it's great to have a daily practice um, and, and breath works great as part of that um, but but the more you practice that, the more you can kind of bring it into other parts of your life. Um, yeah, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. I think I, <laughs> I've got that kind of Saturday evening sort of slightly drifty. <laughs> Been in the sun all day. Thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but oh yeah, let, like also that, um, so you can start bonding with your baby before they've been born um mm. and that you know it might well for me it felt very real you know to, to sort of really sense into that um connection with the, the little being that's growing in there um and for some people it might feel a bit like you're, you're talking to an imaginary friend but but even if it does feel that way that uh, there, there have been scientific studies done about the fact that um if you do what's called pre-birth parenting so start kind of you know connecting with your baby um in the womb that when they're actually born um it kind of helps you to bond with them which is really amazing um but i think also i don't know if you'd agree with this but i, I feel like um you know parenting um it's it's a skill so actually you know it's great to prepare for the the birth but then also to um be aware of the fact that you're going to be doing something that you've never done before potentially um and, and not to necessarily expect yourself to know what to do um which is kind of it's why i'm running the courses that i'm running you know to try and kind of help people to feel a bit more empowered um about how to kind of connect with their baby and learn how to respond to their needs yeah i think it's such a good point because for a lot of us unless we've grown up in a in a big family where we've had younger brothers and sisters or you know close cousins or you know some kind of close knit community, it can sometimes be the first time that people have been around babies and small children when they have their own. Um, since we've you know become more used to living away from our families, we've lost that kind of community connection that gives a lot of people the experience of. Um, not only being around babies and children and witnessing new parents um, but also just that experience of, of watching other people mm. parent and and starting to understand oh yeah the, you know I, I can see that this is something I might resonate with or I don't know if I'd try that myself or whatever it might be but just having that community feel so we we often are stepping into it completely blind 
um, mm -hmm. and just with a huge amount of expectations on ourselves and maybe on the on the baby as well you know mm -hmm. if I do things in this certain way then the baby will respond in this way and actually once you've had a baby of your own you come to realize that they're not always predictable <laughs> sometimes yeah you know, they don't react in the way that you were expecting or hoping that they would and what do you do then mm -hmm. so I think it's wonderful to have courses and, and ways of being supported to give people those skills and that encouragement and, and confidence. Mm. Yeah, and it's interesting how, um, you know, in our culture, it's tended to be the case that, um, that people are kind of separated off into their particular kind of age group or demographic. Like we, we do that through schooling. Um, and then often, you know, if you're in your 20s, um, you don't really hang out necessarily with people who've already got children. And so it can be a really kind of unfamiliar experience but but when you were saying that it just sparked an idea that um wouldn't it be great if in the kind of birth or the parenting preparation classes that you know we had people who already had babies or had toddlers and, and actually those things were integrated you know to help people get that sense of familiarity mm. um, and that it's in that it's okay for it to be untidy and you know it's okay not to know what to do um you know as long as we have the, the confidence to be able to ask for support and help when we need it. Yeah. And somewhere to go to ask for support and help, you know, to know where those yeah. consequences are. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Hmm. Great. Um, so in the show notes below, up below, I'll put links to, um, I've just written a book. Um, it's called Spirited, a creative workbook to prepare you for the adventure of parenting. Um, and it's designed as a course and it's got all of the kind of different elements around, you know, um, how to thrive in your relationship and how to care for yourself in the first six weeks with your baby and all these kind of things. Um, also, I'll also put links to um, all of the amazing work that Sheena is doing. Um, and yeah, as we just mentioned, um, I'll put some links to kind of other sources of support, um, you know, because there are things like um, breastfeeding counsellors that you might not necessarily think that you need before you've had a baby, but actually, you know, that can be incredibly helpful as well. Is there anything you'd like to say just to finish off? Oh wow, yeah, just um that what an amazing journey and it's wonderful that you're um that you're moving into this work of supporting supporting new parents and that um I think the most important thing is that it's it's great to reach out and, and get that support whether you feel whether you think you're completely prepared or whether you feel completely unprepared to just have your circle, mm. find your circle so that you've you've got that support when you need it. Yeah, I think more support than you think you need. Mm. It's a really good idea. Mm. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.